Thank you very much, Steffi Gianni, for this very warm welcome. Thank you, Mr. Seema, to have you here this morning. Um, we heard a lot about the internet and digitalization, but we are also here, sitting here together, because um, there are a lot of problems, a lot of challenges facing Europe. So, um, as Steffi Czerny already said, you're one of the most powerful, most influential persons here in Brussels and uh, in the EU. So, the first thing I would like to ask you is, did you dream of Martin Schulz last night? I'm always dreaming more about ladies. <laughs> so you didn't dream of Martin Schulz, but did you see the debate yesterday in German television? On German television? Of course. Yes. It's a duty to see that. So, and then you already probably recognized that Martin Schulz made a U-turn concerning Turkey and the, the debate and the negotiations about a, a membership, a EU mem membership. That is something um, against the approach of the EU, of President Juncker. So how to deal with that if he might become German Chancellor? Well, one thing at a time. Huh? I think, first of all, on Turkey, um, I don't see this as a U-turn. Huh? I see that everybody has for years been loyal, working with a very close partner in our neighborhood, Turkey, which is there on the map next to us extremely economically important, geopolitically important. The, let's not forget there is a, a war in Syria. Uh, there are a lot of energy interests in the area. And uh, we have uh, three million refugees uh, from Syria hosted at the moment in Turkey, uh, which is uh, the largest hosting of refugees that we have in the neighborhood of the European Union. So to work together with Turkey, which all member states have agreed uh, is an accession state, that means is in talks about accession, is not yet a member, but has the potential to be that, I think is normal. So that's one side of the reality. The other side of the reality is, as President Juncker has said it last week Tuesday in his speech to the ambassadors conference, of the past months, Turkey has walking away with giant steps from the European Union. Not to recognize that would mean to be blind. So I think the, the change that is happening is a response to the change happening in Turkey. One thing is very important. The European Union is in a process of working together with its neighbors. Those neighbors who want to work with us, the door is open, the hand remains stretched out. Those who hit at the hand, or even spit at the hand, they should not expect that the hand stays extended. So what would you suggest how to deal with Turkey right now? Is there still the hand of the EU Commission to say we are still able to do the negotiations, or would you say, well, we have to wait uh, let's say one year, two years, three years, and what's come maybe after after Erdogan. In geopolitically important questions, it's always very important to keep a cool head, not to make policy with Twitter messages, as we see it in other parts of the world. Keep a cool head, discuss and talk, and not to overreact. Huh? Be very firm on our values, be very clear where we stand, and be very clear uh, what President Juncker has said last week, Tuesday, somebody who walks away in giant step has no chance to become a member. On the other side, we are also a, com a, con a continent committed to Christian values. Huh? So when somebody hits us on one side of the face, we don't immediately hit back, but we continue to talk and talk and talk because that's the strength of the European project. To talk, to convince, and to remain open to those who share our values and be firm with those who don't share them. You didn't mention him, but you already said kind of that um, one of the major challenges of the EU is also US President Trump. So um, in his way to be very spontaneous, I want to say um, maybe a little bit unpredictable. How does he also affect this, the EU? How does he and his way to make politics influence the EU right now? The European Union has for decades been very committed to the transatlantic partnership. Huh? And I think that will not change from one day to the other. Huh? Because democracy means also presidents come and go and we have lived with many presidents. We will also live with President Trump, uh, with all the difficulties that you have mentioned. On the other side, we see something that is an indirect effect of Mr. Trump. Capital comes to Europe. Trade partners who are turned away from the US come to Europe. Huh? So in every problem, there is also an opportunity. Huh? And I think uh, we would not have concluded an EU-Japan economic partnership agreement in principle a couple of weeks ago uh, without the developments in the United States of America. We would not see 
uh, capital coming back to Europe, uh, as we have seen it by the optimistic previous speaker about that. Huh? So I think we should not be triumphant about that, but we should recognize that Europe is an attractive place to offer something, to offer a large internal market, to offer more stability, also predictability, even though it is an illusion to think uh, that the world can function without a strong, democratic, value-based, and reliable United States of America. Sounds a little bit that you send a flower bouquet to Mr. Trump lately to ch just to say thank you. Is that right? We are not that cynical. Huh? We would prefer uh, to have stability also in the White House. We look ahead to next week, the State of the Union address by Mr. Um, Juncker. And um, yes, last time he said that uh, the EU is in a very crucial situation. Uh, so looking one year ahead, so looking up to now, what would you say did some of the of the, or did something change in the EU, or are we still there where we have been last year? Well, I think a lot has changed. That makes probably the speech next week more difficult than the speech last year. Last year, it was relatively easy. We can say there is a crisis, we have to pull our sleeves up together and now to get out of the crisis. And he delivered a program that was two days later endorsed by heads of state and government, which we call the Bratislava Roadmap. Now we are uh, in a more difficult time, uh, because there, there is now a window of opportunity. When there's a window of opportunity, you can make two mistakes. You can overshoot and you can undershoot. And I think President Juncker fortunately has the experience and the network of contacts to pitch it right there where it belongs. We have now to use this window of opportunity without putting too much into the window of opportunity. Maybe you might give some more insights So what comes up next week. I have no way to do that because in controversy you say I'm not powerful and the only person who writes the speech is President Juncker. His collaborators are the last people who uh, learn what is in the speech. So we'll like you sitting in front of the television or in, front in the European Parliament next week Wednesday and listen. But I have a lot of confidence and President Juncker that he will seize this moment. So let me make a guess because we, had, uh, we heard what Mr. Juncker said in the beginning of March this year when he gave some outlines what the EU of the future could be like. So there were five different scenarios he made and there was also one scenario saying that the EU of course has to work closer together in certain terms, let's say um, social policies or military policies um, economic policies, is that something we would see maybe next week or here next week? As I said, I don't know what he's going to say, but uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that the questions that were opened up by the white paper, the five scenarios, that he will present his scenario. Uh, because these, the white paper should not be misunderstood as five ideal scenarios how the future of the European Union could like. You could choose one or the other. At the end, there are pedagogical illustration that in some fields, probably, we have to work more together. In others, we may have to work less together. In some, we can leave more to the national and, uh, and regional level. Given I see Mrs. Merkel, uh, who, who uh, thank for the hosting us here, and she would probably agree with this part. There are many things we should do more, but Europe Could can you also give do you more an example and, to and, that? And, and President Juncker is uh, famous for the sentence, we have to be big on big things and small yeah. on small things. Huh? Uh, and uh, small and small things means, for example, we don't have to regulate uh, the funding of the swimming pool in southern Bavaria. Uh, and, uh, or perhaps we don't have, now I'm saying something that Mrs. Mark will not like so much, put all our EU money into funding bicycle lanes in Bavaria. We should perhaps more fund uh, the judicial system in Romania. Uh, but uh, now I have uh, all the Bavarian mayors against me who want to fund their bicycle lanes. Uh, but we have to be serious about that. And... Um, I think it is very good that uh, a couple of months ago, at the 60th anniversary of the Treaty of Rome, uh, when in Rome the leaders of the European Union, President Juncker and the others met, they put a couple of words in writing. One of them was President Juncker's sentence, we have to be big on big things and small on small things. They're all committed to that one. I hope we remember that when we go into the next phase of European integration. Secondly, that was also important, and that comes from this Rome Declaration. It says, Europe has to take its destiny in its own hands. Huh? This sentence was not read in the Rome Declaration. It was only read when something, somebody else, more important, repeated it later in a Bavarian beer tent which perhaps shows that President Juncker has to give his speech next week in a Bavarian beer tent, because that has a better effect. That will be in news. That will be in news, yes. So, um, from your perspective, the ever closer union, is that still something the EU and the Commission is working for, or are we at a point where we could say now we, we reached a point where we're very close, but shouldn't become more closer? Well, ever closer union is a commitment that all member states have taken in our treaties. Huh? There was a moment when to keep Britain in the European Union 
we had even gone so far to say we give it up. Huh? But we also said if Britain says no, then the others of us keep it. I would never interpret ever closer union as a one-way street. I think ever closer union is a sign of modesty. Like we have in the US Constitution, uh, the ambition to be a more perfect union. A more perfect union means you are never perfect. Uh, you have always strive for perfection. The same is ever closer union. We always have to continue to work on the closeness between our people, our countries, and this is a challenge that never goes away. So for me, ever closer union is not a call of all and more and more integration. It's a call from investing every day in the closeness of our partners, our neighbors, the mayor on the other side of the street, the politician from the other party, the person who speaks another language, uh, who has another preference, another experience. That's what ever closer union means. So it's basically a sign of modesty and self-recognition of the European project. Uh, and it means you have to earn it every day. What about a, a, a single finance minister, a EU finance commissioner, who can also raise taxes, for example? That is something that is discussed once again, once again, and very, very uh, different. So what do you think about that? Yeah, we hear a lot about that. I think we should, again, think about the people of Europe. I don't think they're interested in institutions and yet another body and another. We should first of all think what something like that should do. Uh, yes, we can have one day a European finance minister, but first of all, let's think what it should do. Huh? Um, the German audience would say the European finance minister should tell the southern countries not to spend more money. But the German constitutional court will say it can never say that to the German parliament, huh? because that would be unconstitutional. Uh, probably somebody, another member state of the European Union would say the European finance minister that they are to spend a lot of money. I think the truth is somewhere in the middle. So before we go into new institutions, let's think what they should do. The white paper of President Juncker says, form will follow the function. Let's first decide what we want to do together, and then let's decide who does it. I think we have enough presidents, enough institutions. I think it's more time to reduce the number of presidents than to increase them. Is the commission strong enough when, we, when it comes up to 27 um, uh, yeah, commissioners? Is that too much maybe because the one or the other is not that powerful as one could be if it, if it would be less uh, commissioners? I think that's a typical German discussion. Uh, it will not go away because member states think that they want their commissioner in the commission. And that's why President Juncker has reformed the commission and showed that you can organize the commission effectively in a two-layer system with vice presidents and commissioners. And it works very well. I don't think that the commission is at the moment the least efficient of the EU institutions. Huh? Uh, because we have, a, have an institution that is governed by simple majority, that has a strong president who has a say, uh, and who has a say about portfolios, individual decisions, and can set together with the vice president that he has chosen his agenda. Uh, I don't see this in all the other institutions, so everybody should reform their corner. President Juncker has done this with the commission. It's around 10 years ago, I think, when you, personally, you started the fight against the roaming charges in the EU. After 10 years, one can say you have been pretty successful because roaming charges are now stopped. Um, What's up next? What would be your next fight? You would say, what can the EU become much more competitive uh, in terms of what we just heard about internet, digitalization? First of all, it's not true that I contributed to the abolition of roaming charges that were politicians and I only uh, gave advice on that one. Uh, but I think it's good that it has happened finally, even though it took far too long. Huh? Ten years is too long for such an important reform. But we should also think about the competitiveness of the telecom sector and I think that's why it took so long. Secondly, I think the previous speech has given us a lot of hope and it has also given me hope. Huh? He showed one thing, what the internet industry in Europe, the telecom sector, the digital sector have to keep in mind. Venture capital is important. That's why one project of the Juncker Commission is more important than what you're discussing here than anything else. Capital Markets Union. Uh, it's a priority of this commission since the beginning. Mobilize private capital. The Juncker Fund is doing this. Our, our proposal in the field of securitization, private pension products and others are there. They will not change everything one, one day to the other. But that's very important. Huh? I'm a bit worried about those who say, throw more public money at it. Huh? There is not more public money available. And I see there's already a big distribution game going on for the future distribution of the multi-annual financial framework from 
research spending to Bavarian bicycle lanes. I think what is very important that we change the structures in our internal market, that we change the structures of financing, that we allow a Dutch company to issue a private bond also on the French or Spanish market and the other way around, huh? that we get funding uh, out there and that we eliminate the obstacles that are there. Uh, also our defense union, on which uh, President Juncker is working since last year, in which we have taken the first bold decision, is very important. Huh? It hasn't been said by the previous speaker, but a lot of the research in the United States of America and innovation is driven by the military sector. We are far behind there because we're a soft power in Europe, but just creating synergies in our European sector together with research uh, to bring defense industries together may also have very interesting side effects for the sector you're talking about. And last but not least, let's make the most of our internal market. Huh? Yep. I heard with interest everything would have said on e-privacy. Yes, you can argue about this or that comma of this. Uh, this. I have seen this for five years on the general data protection regulation, exactly the same end of the world scenario. At the end, it does one thing, this, this, this proposal for a regulation. It eliminates uh, the, the 28 different uh, rules that we have in the individual member state. And for businesses, this is what really matters. Nothing this e privacy regulation is new. If it didn't exist, the e-privacy regulation, then everybody would fall under the general data protection regulation. So there's no big advantage uh, of that. So I would not go again into a huge lobbying campaign for five years. Let's see the advantage of having one rule for the, for the single market, then companies will adapt. These rules are not as bad as it has been said. So uh, when you talk about this capital market and uh, the VC, so how, how optimistic are you that this will this will be fulfilled um, up to within the next three years, let's say. To build up a venture capital culture takes decades. Huh? And I think we have in Europe an aversion of risk that is sometimes is not good uh, for innovative industries. On the other side, when I look at our financial sector, that's why we didn't cause the financial crisis. Huh? Uh, so I think there's always a good balance between uh, taking too much risk and take too little risk. Yes, Europeans and not only Germans like to put their money on a bank account and not to invest in shares. Sometimes when I look at what we have to do for banks in some of our member states, I would wish that others took more money on their bank account and not invested in shares. Huh? Uh, but I think the, the, this is after the financial crisis, we have to readjust this. Huh? We have to readjust our thinking, finding the right balance between prudence and uh, taking risk, uh, and that is also a cultural issue. That so will not change from one day to the other, and it took in the United States some time in a more entrepreneurial continent. We have to keep working on that one, and yes, we have to promote entrepreneurs and we have to promote open capital markets. A lot of venture capitalists and companies with lots of money are located in Great Britain, specifically in London. So how hard is Brexit affecting your way of policies uh, concerning uh, digitalization and supporting startups, for example? Look, Brexit is a tragedy and it's a stupid decision. But we cannot reverse it. It will stay. And, and the no only people who can reverse it would be the British people yeah. and I'm not a dreamer. So I'm a realist. Brexit will happen on the 29th of March 2019 and I think everybody is well advised, investors and everybody else, to move on and live with this reality. Uh, Brexit will happen on the 29th of March 2019 and uh, what only we can do, offer to help to accommodate the consequences. But I think it takes two to tango and at the moment these uh, Argentinian rhythms are not yet widely spread. You're very strict and you're very, very uh, yeah, powerful in saying that there is no U-turn concerning the Brexit or no exit from the Brexit. What makes you, you so, so very um, sure that, that the British government if you look at the negotiations, you might have the impression that they might try to exit from Brexit. So why are you so sure that there will be no exit from the Brexit? Well, in politics uh, and in legal matters, we have to look what are the facts and what is on the table. And what is on the table is a letter formally signed by the British government that they want to leave on the 29th of March 2019. And every day this is being repeated and repeated and repeated. I don't think we should discuss scenarios that are not on the table. Would you uh, bet on the that? only people who can bring another scenario on the table are the British, but I think that uh, is at the moment not something we can dream about. Some of us may want to dream about it, but I would not dream about it. I would live with the reality and make uh, factor that in in my investment decisions. Would you bet on that? That there will be a Brexit, definitely, 
Uh, I'm, I'm a lawyer, so I'm not in the business of begging. Okay. I read what is in front of me. I see if there is a decision. There is a decision, and I'm respectful of democracies. The British democracy, for good or for bad, has taken a decision. We have to respect it, even though we don't like it. And I think there's no reason to speculate uh, that somebody reverses this decision. Only the British people could reverse this decision. So it would be arrogant from us to say we could. The British are, like to go to the, to the uh, bookmakers. And if you go to Petty Power, for example, on the webpage, you will see that they're also not that sure if, if there will be a Brexit, uh, Brexit deal uh, until 1st of April 2019. And there's also another bet you can make. You can also bet that the UK will apply to rejoin the EU by 2027. Um, and it's a three to one offer. So, what do you think about that? Can there be a reunion, kind of? Can there be a rejoining by the British? Look, the difference between us and our British friends is we read papers, we draft proposals, and we don't go to the bookmakers. <laughs> That's sad, in a way. <laughs> But well, legally, it is possible, that's the last paragraph of Article 50 of the treaty, somebody who has left can apply to join again. So the door of the European Union after the 29th of March 2019 will be always open. And as all of us have British friends, that is, of course, something that we humanly wish. Uh, but politically, I think, uh, at the moment, this option is not on the table. So let's be realistic about that. Would you say that, or do you think that there might be also other countries then starting an exit, trying to exit from the EU? The European Union is not a prison of people, but a voluntary union. Huh? So everybody is there not by force, but because they want to be there, because they see that overall sharing sovereignty in the European Union is a positive thing. Brexit has more reinforced this sense of belonging together uh, because one sees it can also go the other way around and it is not an undivided success story so far. But I think we should never take the European Union and the fact that it has its members that it currently has for granted. It has to be earned every day. And I think that is the work that President Juncker, his whole team, the whole commission, and I think all leaders in the 27 member states are working on to keep the unity of the 27 and to make the European Union a more attractive place. Huh? Because Brexit is also a wake-up call. It shows us what we can lose from one day to the other. Do you think that this wake-up call is heard also in, let's say, Warsaw, um, maybe also in Budapest, that countries who are very, sometimes very opponent to the EU and to Brussels now shift to a more pro-EU way in politics? I think we have to distinguish between governmental decisions in these countries and the overall feeling of the people. Poland is a very pro-European country with pro very pro-European citizens. We should not give up on them, on the contrary. Huh? We should stretch out here again our hands every day, offer dialogue, advice, uh, being firm on our values, but never give up. In particular, Germans should never give up on Poland. Poland is a very important partner for peace and stability in the European Union. And I think Germans are well advised to be very humble when it comes to giving advice to Poland. When we talk about challenges facing the EU, we also have to talk about the upcoming German uh, uh, election, the federal election uh, on the 24th of September. So how important is the outcome of this, of this election for, uh, for Europe, for the future of the EU within the next two or three or four years? I think all elections in Europe are important for the future of Europe. I think the Czech elections in a couple of weeks, uh, a neighbor to uh, Bavaria, are probably even more important than the German election because there is really something happening that can be good or bad. Huh? I think the German elections are something that show us we can sleep in peace. Because the German elections, whatever happens there, we will see a lot of stability and continuity. And this is good. We saw yesterday evening on TV a debate that was on facts. Many of my, my foreign you colleagues spoke the whole to me and, and were very surprised that they really discussed EU policies, they went into the details. And I think we saw a very adult, mature discussion between two leaders of two uh, important groups that can win the next elections, and both of them uh, were dealing with the facts and uh, with arguments. Uh, and I think that shows that uh, we don't have to be worried about Germany. Whatever, Whoever will govern Germany afterwards, even though I'm rather sure who will govern Germany afterwards, will continue the very pro-European course. There may be this or that nuance, but we can be sure that Germany will be a reliable force in European integration, and that is something we, we, we can be happy and confident about. Thank you very much for this insight, uh, because you just said that you're sure, pretty sure, who is going to uh, govern Germany uh, for the next four years. Maybe you might tell us 
Is it Mrs. Merkel? And is she in coalition with Mr. Lindner or with Mr. Schulz? That would be far outside my body. As I said, we are not going to the bookmakers, we are not making bets. Huh? But I'm nevertheless privately very confident uh, who will win this German election. Thank you very much, Mr. Selma. And it was a great insight to have from you here uh, at DLD conference in Brussels. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time, talking to us and giving us some insights. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>